Intellectual Project of Lígia Santos. Pelo telefone, by telephone, was the first ever recorded, the first samba ever recorded in Brazil. It was recorded in 1916 by Donga and Mauro de Almeida. Donga was a pioneering samba composer from the docks of Rio de Janeiro. And Almeida was a reporter who used to follow samba groups from that part of the city. Such historical recording made Donga one of the most influential samba composers of his days. Donga was already well known when his daughter, Ligia Santos, was born in 1934, from his union with Zaira de Oliveira, one of the few lyrical black singers at that time. Ligia learned to play the piano, but in the crossroads between erudite and popular, she devoted herself to samba as her main study and research topic. She published the book, Paulo da Portela, a bridge between two cultures, with Marília Trindade Barbosa, an important study about the samba composer Paulo da Portela, who founded the traditional Portela Samba School in Rio de Janeiro. With this book, Ligia Santos became the first black woman researcher to publish a study about samba, the most famous Afro-Brazilian written in Brazil. Ligia Santos broke the rules not only from the samba universe, where the woman's role was appreciated mainly in the culinary field and in the Afro-Brazilian religious rituals, but also from the global society, which is known to hold prejudice towards women's intellectual production, especially from a black woman. The story of Paulo da Portela told by Ligia Santos and her co-author, is essential to understand what we may call Samba's second phase, from the late 1920s and 1930s, when the Samba schools and their big parades were created. At that time, Samba was modernized and became famous as Brazil national music. Yet, in order to understand Ligia Santos' intellectual trajectory, we need to go back in time and reconstitute an age prior to her birth. It is all about the environment of Samba's first phase, which took place in the docks of Rio de Janeiro, where Samba's aunts from Bahia played a leading role. In 1916, when Donga composed the song by telephone, the docks of Rio de Janeiro in the center of the city were known as Little Africa. The area got this name because of the great number of migra migrant black people from Bahia that lived there. At the end of the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th, Rio was already a city with a large population of black people, and the black Baianos contributed to increase the figures. Most of the migrants from Bahia came at the end of the 19th century and were free Afro-Brazilians. The female leaders of Little Africa, called Ants, were also from Bahia, they were the religious and economic reference of the community. The ants were the mães de santo of the Afro-Brazilian religion called Candomblé. At the same time, they started to sell the food of the saints, such as Akarajé and Abará, in the streets of Rio. The ants' houses were a very important place for the Afro-Brazilian cultural resistance. Samba had been forbidden at the beginning of the 20th century. The backyards of the ants' houses were the place for the samba ritual, where samba could be played away from the eyes 
of the policy authorities. Many researchers believe that the samba was born in the ants' houses. Donga, as well, had the same opinion. The pioneers of samba used to meet in my house, said Donga in his book of memories. Donga was the son of a samba's aunt. He was born in Rio in 1889, but his mother came from Bahia. As Donga said, his mother liked to give big parties of samba because she was a Baiana and she brought the party feeling in her blood. The heritage of the samba's ants is too important in the samba world, but, really, but Ligia Santos changed the role of the woman who was born in a community of sambistas. Most of the daughters of samba learned the traditional culinary or became singers and dancers in the schools and groups of samba. In other words, they became samba's ants. That was not the destiny of Ligia Santos. She was interested in the intellectual discussion surrounding the musicians and the Brazilian society. In the late 1960s, Ligia Santos graduated as a lawyer and teacher. She also worked as an assistant in the research by the writer Sérgio Cabral about Pixinguinha, one of the most famous names in Brazilian music, who played with Dog in the group, in the group Os Oito Batutas, the eight smart guys. The admiration for Paulo da Portela's work made Lydia reconstruct his life story. For me, Paulo da Portela is a genius. He stands out from the others, she states when, uh, in an interview that I did with her. <laughs> the time she spent together with the senior members of Portela School was also critical for her research. As Lydia said, I went to Portela and heard former samba composers, his contemporary friends, reporting facts from Paulo's life. And every story I heard made me feel even more enthusiastic. They told me in Portela that Paulo wanted the samba composers to keep their feet and necks busy. <laughs> he did not want relaxed composers ignoring the importance of this new music that was being born. Ligia Santos devoted herself to researching about Paulo da Portela in the late 1970s. Ligia was well known and respected by the samba community, especially for being Donga's daughter and a black intellectual. In such conditions, she made space for Marília Barbosa, a middle-class white researcher who proposed to work by her side. Ligia Santos' work is made from her position as a mediator between two cultures. Ligia Santos is a transcultural, transcultural mediator, bringing the universe of samba and national culture together. Obviously, there had been other mediators who had done that before her, yet, she was the first black woman to achieve this, inverting the place, the place of oral tradition reserved to women in the samba universe. I spent two years walking around the streets of the Madureira neighborhood where Portela was founded, talking with its senior members I plunged deep into that, said Ligia. She was rewarded for such devotion by getting the first place in a monography contest held by the Brazilian National Foundation for the Arts, resulting in the publishing of the historic book, Paulo da Portela. <laughs> Similarly to Ligia Santos, 
Paulo da Portela tried to link distant universes as well. As Lisa wrote, his idea about winning was to conquer chances in another culture, to become accepted as an equal. We may say that Paulo da Portela paid a high price in his struggle to make Samba respected. In 1949, Paulo left Portela school and went into obscurity until his death in 1954. Ligia Santos' project rescued the historical importance of Paulo da Portela to the Samba culture. Ligia Santos, the daughter of Samba, constructed a bridge between two cultures, the Samba culture of her family and the academic culture acquired with determination, courage, and talent, overcoming barriers and prejudice. Thank you. We call upon our intellectual metro lineage. Zora Neale Hurston, who taught us that there is a depth of thought and a gulf of formless feelings untouched by thought, and that we can enter this infinity again and again. Mary View Chauvet, who taught us to embrace the hunger of the body and that of the soul, and the hunger of the mind and the senses. My great-grandmother, Molly Knuckles, who told us in the middle of a storm to be still because the Lord is working. Amen. Alice Walker, who taught us that it is in our power to save lives because the life we save is our own. Mm -hmm. Edwidge Danticat, who told us to create dangerously for people who read dangerously. Magalie Marceline and Miriam Merlet, who in their sudden departure from this earth forced our emotions to the raw, tender surface. And to Ghislaine Chalier, who taught us to privilege our imaginative memory. And to Audre Lorde, who taught us to be blessed within our many selves, who are come to make our shattered faces whole. Our paper today is a meditation on feelings and emotions in the black woman intellectual tradition. This meditation represents a part of our shared academic goal to work toward an understanding and an articulation of emotions and feelings as tools that not only motivate our study of black women's lives, but that also enable us to better read and apply black women's knowledge. In this paper, we use the work of Haitian militant and author Marie Seliegno and African-American poet dramatist Intozaki Shange to extract a way to think about emotion and feeling as the bridge that we must cross in order to more fully understand the processes and stakes of black women's intellectual work. We foreground Agnon and Shange's use of and reliance on emotion, not as a means of charging or animating their, their work, but instead as a way of creating a space in which their creativity could take root or do its work. Focusing on Agnon's La Livre de Emma, the Book of Emma, and Intoshake Shange's dramatic text for colored girls who've considered suicide when the rainbow is enough, we show how black women's intellectualizing owes as much to empathy, compassion, and the feelings and sensations of the body as it does to the political demands of combating oppression. We are then attending to the tender side of these women's works. So in this paper, we outline the trajectory of arriving at this tender place, which as we found by consorting with Agnon and Shange, often leads us to and through madness. More specifically, we consider Agnon's narrative of Emma and Flore, two black women intellectuals who, as patient and doctor in a psychiatric ward, find a sentient language and lexicon for their lives and creative process. We also consider the women of Shanghai's for colored girls, specifically the lady in blue, the lady in green, and the lady in yellow, who use dance, poetry, and music to not only confess to abortion rape and the desires that go unheard and unrecognized in the worlds they inhabit, 
but who also use these forms to recover their capacity to feel. As we turn to the space of women's literature and performance, two symbolic spaces of passion and immediacy, we charge ourselves to attend to the imprint of emotion upon our intellectual process, and more specifically, upon the way that we could find and engage with the archive. Much of what we are saying resonates with Audre Lorde's idea of the erotic, beginning with our decision to propose a jointly written paper. Mm -hmm as a way of sharing deeply our pursuit to understand and articulate the unwritten magic mm -hmm. that stirs and shapes the contours of our intellectualizing. In so doing, we are pushed to reassess the quality of our work and lives and how we move and through them, move in and through them. When we foreground how mm -hmm. and, and quality in this way, we are able to take stock of the bridge that joins their artistry and our commitment to just, compassionate intellectual work. And building on that foundation, created by women intellectual workers in the fields of literature, performance studies, history, black diasporic studies, we attend to the future. And the future of these fields is feeling. In consorting with Agno and Shanghai, we travel through four transitions to this tender place. We identify those transitions as estrangement, combat breathing, the howl, and marinage. The first stop along this journey was confronting the women characters' refusal to engage emotionally. In these texts, this refusal grew out of a metaphysical dilemma of being alive and being a woman and being colored. In the case of For Colored Girls, and for The Lady in Blue specifically, this dilemma is manifested in her frustration with the messiness of feeling. She declares, we deal with emotion too much, so why don't we go ahead and be white then? The lady in blue here suggests that black women become something unlike themselves, something beyond the reach of feeling, leaving them inanimate, and as Emma described Florey in the book of Emma, as white porcelain dolls. But as the women discovered, becoming white comes with its own cost. It is abstract, a condition contrived by the rational mind at the exclusion of emotion and spirit. Thus, in the service of, or perhaps under the guise of surviving, we move far from our uh, deepest knowing and we grow suspicious of our right to feel and to community and to individuality. So, we turn off, we shut down so that we can move on. There, but not there. Feeling, but not feeling. This condition is what we are calling estrangement. It refers to the materiality of our body minus that animating force of life that results in a severance or a severe constriction of sentience or our capacity to feel. Shange evokes our idea in, the un in, in untitled prefatory remarks to her 1981 collection of three plays entitled Three Pieces. And she says, quote, there are some thoughts that black people just don't have according to popular mythology. So white people never imagine we are having them. And black people block vocabularies we perceive to be white folks' ideas. And this will never do. For in addition to the obvious stress of racism and poverty, Afro-American culture, in attempts to carry on, to move forward, has minimized its emotional vocabulary to the extent that admitting feelings of rage defeat, frustration, is virtually impossible outside of a collective voice." End quote. This estrangement is a direct denial of feeling and the reclamation of power that it can allow. In turning from feeling, the Lady in Blue is inevitably turning to its opposite, the pornographic. Regarding it, however, facetiously, as a place of stability, the Lady in Blue's strategy of survival resonates with Audre Lorde's definition of pornography as, quote, the suppression of true feeling, which emphasizes sensation without feeling, end quote. In this state, our capacity to feel fully is diminished. We become but a shell of ourselves, a breathing denial of our po power and possibility. But embedded in this breath, although faint, is the veritable weapon of what Franz Fanon calls combat breathing. By Fanon's account, 
in the state of occupied territories, the very pulsations of territory and persons under occupation are entangled with the systemic oppressions that ultimately seek their demise. With an unmatched greed and pornographic appetite, occupation forces feed upon the disfigurement, brokenness, and destruction of the occupied. Therefore, the very premise of leave, living, inhale, exhale, is achieved only through struggle. This state of agony, exhaustion, and war, combat breathing, is the condition of occupied life. When used in the hands of Emma, Flore, and the Color Girls, combat breathing is not only wielded against occupational forces and estrangement, but also, as Sean Gay suggests, becomes a living response, the drive to reconcile ir the irreconcilable. As a living response, combat breathing confronts the, quote, the involuntary constrictions and amputations of their humanity, end quote, and subsequently exposes the rickety scaffolding of oppressive occupational forces. Through their deployment of combat breathing, the women not only resist total occupation, but also hold within themselves the will to clarify and the means to remedy their constrictive, the constricted and amputated humanity. Emma challenges us to extend, to deepen our combat breathing into a how. Having moved from the constriction of estrangement to the remedy of combat breath, we meet Emma in an insane asylum, in, an, in the insi asylum of insanity, mm -hmm. where many of us black women have found ourselves or questioned if we should be. A psychiatric hospital, the graveyard of black female intellect, creativity, and deepest emotion, misunderstood, mistranslated, misdiagnosed. To her, to her doctors, Emma is simple and stubborn. She is the, quote, Negro lady in room 122, quote, end quote, who killed her firstborn child after she failed her dissertation defense, twice. Emma is their job, their latest subject. They must determine her ability to stand trial. This evaluation, however, requires talking to Emma, but Emma refuses to cooperate. She refuses to speak their language, the language of academics, but rather insists on speaking her native tongue, asserting that, quote, a howling beast never borrows the voice of another animal, end quote. Flore is a linguist known to speak Emma's native black tongue and is brought, into, and is brought, into, is brought in to encourage her to speak. Although Flore has tried to distance herself from Emma and from herself, this calculated distancing is put into question within moments of meeting Emma when Emma screams the painfully obvious. <laughs> You're here repeating all my words for these whites without missing a single one. <laughs> Poor Dolly. That's what I'll call you from now on. One could easily confuse you with a porcelain doll." End quote. Mm -hmm. Emma recognizes the shell of a woman Flore has become in, a, in a order to appeal to an epistemology that is not concerned with or for her. Emma opens the door to room 122 and lets out a strident howl that, sat, that resounds in the long corridor and curdles Flore's blood. Emma explains, Quote, we are a few true black women in this wing. We greet each other this way from time to time. <laughs> we scream for all those women they deny the right to be heard, end quote. Here, the how becomes the necessary mode of communication, the sentient language and lexicon of Emma and her insane sisters. This formulation is indebted to Mae Henderson's analysis of Sula's orgas orgasmic how in her 1989 article, Speaking in Tongues, Dialogics, Dialectics, and the Black Women Writers Literary Tradition. Like Sula, Emma and the colored girls have to disrupt the dominant discourse not only to be heard, but to define themselves for themselves. As a case in point, it is no coincidence that Emma draws Flore into her madness by inviting her to howl. Don't you want to scream with me, Dolly? It is now through the how that Emma returns to the prediscursive center of experience that positions her at a vantage point outside of, the outside of the dominant discursive order. The how is a form of speaking in tongues and a linguistic discurs discurs disruption that serves as a precondition, end quote, for a state of clarity and perception that we call marunage, a tender place for themselves and for black women's intellectualizing. Thus the howl is at once the lambi, 
the call for community and the gateway into black women's most real selves. The howl as an expression of madness is a beginning that masks itself as a tragic end. But in community, it loses its insane solitary quality and becomes a speaking in tongues, a laying on of hands. And slain in the spirit, the how returns us to our holiness. And that holiness, the pre-discursive mode that can only be regained and reclaimed through consorting with madness, brings us to the place of liberation, a place of res resurrection, a sacred place. In Marinage, Emma communes with the quote, Emma's before, end quote, and it invokes the quote, eternal maroons, end quote, who have guided her to this new vantage point outside of the dominant discursive order. It is in this space with the eternal maroons that the living and the living dead are in conversation with one another, and we possess each other's multiplicitous narratives. We are in favor of this tender place, serene, clear, post-coital, where all of our colors rest together. This place, as the Lady in Brown imparts, quote, is for colored girls who have considered suicide, but who are moving to the ends of their own rainbows, end quote. Shange and Ignault call us to recover the quality of our work through this tender place. They instruct us how to experience and intellectualize black women's lives. They, they hearken to us to release ourselves from our estrangement, from our occupied selves, from our pornographic appetites, and from our constrictive lexicons that distort our brilliance. They urge us to find a façon de vivre, a façon de faire, a space of marinage that may not be extracted from the archives, disciplines, or theories, but that is resurrected from a reclamation of our most frenzied, emotional, mad selves. This means searching the archive of the tear, the archive of our combat breathing, the archive of the howl. And it is in these expressions that we bring justice, humanity, and compassion to an often skeletal image of ourselves. Thank you. Good afternoon. For my paper, I begin with several questions. One, have African American women singer songwriters achieved the same level of success and expressive freedom as their peers and other social groups? Do they enjoy the creative and artistic privilege accorded the proverbial American quote unquote rock star on par with their white female counterparts? Or are they forced to conform not just to limiting gender stereotypes, but also racial ones? In today's popular culture, the African American woman songstress still conforms to a short list of stereotypes, whether willingly or coerced the sultry seductress and or a triple threat who can sing, dance, and sometimes act, uh, <laughs> for example. Not to name any names, but maybe Beyonce. <laughs> the oversex hoe, such as Little Kim or uh, Foxy Brown, or the bad girl, such as Missy Elliott or pre-conversion Mary J. Blige. Those who do not fit within these easy categories seem to fade away, appearing occasionally in movies and television shows and cameo roles, such as Macy Gray. Others carve a niche for themselves, off, often in resort of vacation spots, such as Tony Braxton's notable Vegas bookings. Only a handful of black women seem to escape the narrow and still demeaning confines of the expectation of the music consuming public and the music and entertainment industries, regardless of race, gender, ethnicity, or sexual orientation. An affable favorite, for example, the amiable, uh, lovable crossover whose charm and grace erases both race and genders, Queen Latifah, whom one could affectionately call the Oprah of the music biz, still <laughs> operates within the narrow confines to which one must also add body size. Those who cannot fit one of these roles or find a niche seem to disappear quietly, such as Ch Tracy Chapman, 
Others work diligently and productively, if not famously, like the folks of this paper, Michelle Indigi Ocello. She's one of a long list of singer-songwriters from the 1980s and 1990s. She's a bassist, composer, songwriter, and producer. She released the album Peace Beyond Passion in 1996 on Madonna's Maverick Records. Uh, the album, the CD, met with clinical, uh, excuse me, critical success. <laughs> <laughs> With Indege Ocello bridging a, this crucial divide between hip hop and 1970s soul and funk at the birth of what later became termed by musicologists such as myself and critics, uh, neo soul. Musically, her um, bass style and her composing and singing fit within this industry and hegemonic notions about black music. In her case, this fresh sound, this fresh sounding hip hop, soul, jazz, come funk uh, mashup, less easy to categorize is her songwriting. She doesn't follow the well-trod path of singing conventional songs of love or, and seduction or the up-tempo dance tunes, long on hooks and beats, but short on lyrics. Rather, her lyrics float above the bass grooves. They are socially conscious and venture beyond the political safe zone canvassed by both her white socially uh, conscious peers and her African-American cohorts. So my focus today is on Peace Beyond Passion, in which she makes uh, bold artistic decisions to title a number of her songs after uh, the Bible. If you look at those songs, we see particularly here in Deuteronomy, Ecclesiastes, uh, uh, we see that in Leviticus, particularly with uh, her titles, Deuteronomy and Leviticus, where she borrows these titles from the first five books of the Bible, also known as the Law of Moses, also known as the Pentateuch, along with uh, Genesis, Genesis, Exodus, Numbers. So a close reading of the song, looking at it, one, as a song cycle, and two, a complete narrative, uh, this organ whole reveals her social instruction and critique in both her lyrics and her music. She speaks as a black queer woman for whom love and loss and her very being are complicated by identity. Sexism as a woman, racism from the hegemonic group coupled with homophobia from the African American community. In Peace Beyond Passion, Ndege Ocello has constructed a black woman's pentateuch. Her Pentateuch addresses black science on homosexuality and homophobia in the black community, calls out the sexual exploitation of black women, and confronts domestic violence. She, like generations of African American women singers before her, uses her music to simultaneously speak truth to power held and wielded by the hegemonic culture and to bring focus to egregious violations of black women. Moreover, by conjoining black gender and queer sexuality, she makes a transgressive stance far ahead of her peers, such as Janet Jackson, Tracy Chapman, or Little Kim, who've either sung gender-bending lyrics, addressed domestic violence and queer realities, or celebrated black uh, female sexuality and sexual freemen, uh, excuse me, well, freedom, though within the safe zone accorded those who conform to gender and race stereotypes. Through her choice of instruments, musical style, physical representation, and song lyrics, Indege Ocello constructs a black queer feminist critique of race, sexuality, and violence, both psychological and physical, that places her in the tradition of other African American women who trouble restrictive black female race gender roles and thereby reclaim personal and collective power with the intent to provoke her audience first to cultural critique, then to action. If we go forward, you see here in Bigio Cello's aesthetic. Uh, and if you look down, particularly at the bottom, where uh, in Bigio Cello um, says that her songwriting, many of her songs and her music uh, come from personal experience. But if we look further, um, you see she describes herself at the very bottom as a cultural an an uh, anthropologist. She likens her work, creative work to that, she, uh, stating, culture and art in general play a role in capturing the spirit of the times. In this way, artists are like anthropologists, just documenting the present. 
So we'll go forward and, and look at the present that she documents. Um, uh, this is a, a photograph, a clip of, uh, of an important article that Greg Tate wrote, What is Hip Hop, from, uh, that appeared in Vibe, which is now defunct as a print magazine in November 1993. And Dege Cello quoted Tate in her first album, uh, The Liner Notes to Plantation Lull Lullabies, where she uh, described hip hop as dope noology. And s she states that the only alternative, the only alternative hip hop, the only alternative to hip hop is silence. And Tate capitalizes, and Indigia Cello reta retains this capitalization that we also see in the titles of her track. And for those of you who are uh, website savvy, in cyberspace, capitalization is the equivalent of shouting. So Indigia Cello takes us from silence. The lack of hip hop is silence to metaphorical and little shouting, cultural shouting, and uh, we proceed. I began in my uh, study with uh, Indege Ocello's uh, Deuteronomy meter man, if we will. Mm -hmm. And the first thing I uh, when we, why are we clicking through so fast? Okay, cool. <laughs> uh, if you can see the lyrics, you see that she quotes extensively from Genesis in, in these lyrics, and in particularly one lyrics where she, dis she describes what she, a black woman who conceived of herself as one way until one night she and her, her man metamorphosized into black butterflies. And uh, of course, we're familiar with Genesis and a story of, of, of creation, the creation story, uh, the creation of Adam and Eve, the population of the earth, and, and the covenant. If I may have the clip, please. Yeah. Uh, it's playing. Sound, please. Uh, do we do we have sound? Okay. Well, we can go. We can go forward. Uh, we don't have sound for just a moment, so we will uh, just go forward to my uh, next clip, where where we can work with this one, and we don't need sound. Some of you may be familiar with her her uh, track, her song uh, Leviticus Faggot, in which she um, cr critiques the silence of homosexuality and homophobia in the black community. Um, and the lyric from that particular cl the clip, but not only in the video, I want to talk today about the video. And in the video, she also, she and the director, Kevin Bray, go so far as to also critique the, hypo the hypocrisy within the black church. For example, if I could, if you could uh, start the video just by clipping on the, um, if you could start the video just by clipping, just by clicking on the bottom. And let's see what happens in the video. Here, we, the director quotes a scene from Vin Vendor's Wings of Desire. Thank you. And we begin the church scene. Now watch very closely. Oh, yeah. 
Not only do we have the, the, the harsh criticism, you see that scowl on her face at the end of the clip, uh, in the next scene, uh, it, we see the son out on the street because he's been turned out as a prostitute by the young man that we saw in the beginning of the clip. But if you notice, we see Michelle in drag, and if you notice the, the when she turned to kiss one of the uh, women congregants, one of the women ministers, you know, and she can't contain herself with that little bit of naughtiness as she chuckles in the camera, the camera, uh, we have a quick cut to the wide shot, and then another quick cut, and we see, we see him adjust, adjust his tie, in which she is really calling out all of those black uh, ministers and preachers and members of black clergy and all these men who prey upon other, their female congregants, their female parishioners, and calling out the hypocrisy of this. How can you condemn this one form of, of, of sexual behavior when you yourself are guilty of this other form of sexual behavior? That is prescribed in uh, Numbers, the, the first law, and also in Deuteronomy, the second law. <laughs> and then, if we can go forward, if you will, I want to go talk now about, uh, we will go forward, and she also uh, deals with this issue of the down low, to which she alludes in that clip that I just saw you. We see the man with the blue bandana, possibly the gang bandana, and this very knowing look by our male prostitute. Uh, and we really don't know, and the same thing in her song, uh, who is he and what is he to you? Well, did this young male, gang, gang the, the banger, did he pick up a woman, or did he? Is he buying a, a transsexual, a male, trans, you know, a male prostitute who's dressed as a woman? We don't know. That's not clear. The same thing with uh, who is who is he and what is he to you? Uh, where you don't know is she speaking? Is her partner is that a, is that a woman? in which infidelity with another male is not a problem because it restores the so-called natural order, but if her partner is a male who's on the down low, a man who has romantic relationships or sex with other men, well then that is so far out of society's prescriptions. But the cosmic co cosmos that she has created is incredibly queer because what we hear is our or masculine gendered music, such as the blues, for example, and hard soul. The final thing I want to start with, uh, listen to, is this issue of, well, if I get a chance, I'll talk about this issue of domestic violence in which she explores. And she explores domestic violence by taking us to, just as in her critique of criticism, she takes us to the mourner's bench. She takes us to the, the process that happens during a black gospel service, during the altar call, the minister calls, the, church, the doors of the church are open, people come up, and then the musicians play shout chorus the bass and piano and other musicians are riffing over and over again. And it's that moment where one is on the potential of healing. So the question, if we go back to this notion of Genesis with its long genealogy that's based on patriarchy about a people that are chosen set apart, we have Michelle here with her gene genealogy to close and bring us full circle to the womb, the womb birth being a kind of Genesis. But her genealogy is matriarchal because the patriarchal here, the father is a, an abuser. He's a batterer. And this has been passed from one generation to the other. And she is determined that it shall end with her and it will not be passed on to her child. We never achieve full healing, but we are just as though we are at that moment in the gospel church service, where the shout chords are played, where we are on the verge of healing, where you're at a crossroads when a choice can be made not to break this generational cycle. Okay. Um, so it's with great honor and humility that I present this paper that I've retitled, because I'm just retitling everything these days, um, Black Sonic Revivals and the Strange Sampling of Nina Simone. 
Um, I would like to thank the conference organizers, Mia Bay, Martha Jones, and my colleague, Barbara Savage, for organizing this space of strategic collaboration and deliberate meditation on the intellectual work and afterlife of women throughout the African diaspora. I would like to thank my many reader friends, uh, Gershon Aviles, uh, Erica Edwards, the Guy Ramsey, uh, Joe Schloss, and John Stevens. And I would like to especially thank Farrah Griffin. So I thought Farrah was going to be like on that side of the table, but she's right next to me. I would like to thank uh, Farrah Griffin, who has not only worked diligently to host us and provide uh, this Columbia home for the making and the sharing of black feminist thought and courageous social action, but has acted as a model and muse for me for a long time now. I've had the privilege and the divine fortune of taking a class my senior year when the then junior professor, Farrah Jasmine Griffin, was working on what would later become, if you can't be free, be a mystery in search of Billie Holiday. My intellectual and personal debt to you is incalculable. <laughs> and, so, okay. and since this is a paper on genealogies, I would like to say um, for those of us who have been touched by Farah through the page or in the classroom, we are more critical scholars and more creative citizens and ultimately better, or ultimately and simply better people. <laughs> <laughs> and um, if we can now play Nita. <laughs> this can be up. Yeah. And it's just a And so what's for That was that came as the But you know, to me is my favorite. And I think Strangers deals with things and deals with America, so we say. There's some bright people. And I was <laughs> the Yeah, the same thing as you. I mean the same as you. You're right. It deals with America. And the black and white problem, really. The ugliness of it, that is about the ugliest song I have ever heard. Ugly in the sense that it is violent and tears at the guts of what white people have done to my people in this country. Once called the Chanteuse of the Civil Rights, it can, it's going to start, okay. Once. Okay, but I'm going to talk over it, right? Yeah, we got it. Okay. Once called the Chanteuse of the Civil Rights Movement by Stokely Carmichael, Nina Simone has recently surfaced as the ultimate icon of black radicalism for a pantheon of African-American male hip-hop acts, ranging from the socially conscious camp of Kam and Mostef, Talib Kweli and The Roots, to the less politically inclined artists such as 50 Cent, Cassidy, Lil Wayne, Timberland, and most frequently by producer and rapper Kanye West. Influenced by the widespread interpolation of Nina Simone in the predominantly masculinist hip hop culture, this essay analyzes the relationship of sound between Billie Holiday and Nina Simone and the unexpected artist, street battle rapper Cassidy, to theorize how music m mediates relationships and political statements across time and space, and how sampling works to forge an intergenerational community of what I'm calling sonic black radicalism. In the case of Nina Simone, sonic black radicalism describes her unique commitment to the freedom struggle through what Michael Denning would call the politics of allegiances and affiliations, such as her fundraising and marching with SNCC, and her politics of form, and that's from Denning, and I would describe that as an aesthetic practice based on her sonic experimentation and her steadfast cross crossing of the musical color line. Interestingly, oh, sorry. Uh, Okay, so interestingly enough, Simone's musical fluidity preceded and, sh and was shaped uh, by, her musical fluidity preceded uh, her more formal political activism. Black classical music, and this is the term that uh, she describes her music as, was actually the birthright of the young Eunice Wayman in Tyrone, North Carolina, who grew up loving and learning Beethoven, Bach, and Chopin from her treasured English piano teacher, Miss Mazzy, while being sonically baptized as a piano prodigy at the tender age of three years old in the church of her preacher mother, Mary Kate. By the time she emerged on stage as Nina Simone, um, she would call this folk music at the beginning of her career, 
but as I said, by the end of her career, she had not only expanded her repertoire from European classical music, pop standards, gospel, blues, jack to ja jazz, to include rock and funk, but also added calypso, sukus, and mambo, ultimately naming this genre into one of her own, calling it black classical music. And it reminds me of what Elizabeth said about uh, Zora modeling herself on herself. Nina Simone invented a genre that she could fit into. Refusing a false divide between aesthetics and politics, Simone intuitively understood the mutually constitutive relationship between American racial categories and musical expressions when she said, quote, I didn't fit into the ideas, into white ideas of what a black performer should be. It was a racist thing, end quote. So it is within these racialized sounds and systems of Jim Crow, we can fully, uh, more fully appreciate Simone as an artist who actively sought to desegregate sound and space, a form of sonic black radicalism, which both revealed and resisted the multidimensional nature of American racism. The presence of these sonic rebellions, that black noise, had always been Simone's goal. She once told an interviewer, quote, it has always been my aim to stay outside of any category. That's my freedom. End quote. Driving industry, tastemakers, and music executives crazy, her unclassifiability simultaneously defied the limits of musical genre, but the racial system of Jim Crow as well, thereby modeling a new social contract between listener and sound, between the black citizen and the state. And it's through this disavowal that she, not, that she created black, but not race music, and wrote herself into a longer tradition of sonic black radicalism that is both backward looking and forward thinking. Through Simone's 1965 cover of Billie Holiday's classic Strange Fruit, and then the later sampling of her cover by artist Cassidy, and you'll also hear the common version, which was unreleased, we can hear a double movement. First, Simone fully establishes herself as the daughter of Holiday's political and sonic legacies. For Holiday was the singer Simone most covered and with whom she saw herself in conversation. And second, through this retelling, the long history of black radicalism, sonic or otherwise, emerges as an always already matrilineal one. Who's singing Billy's song? The cover. Simone's musical intertextuality with Holiday could be traced back to her chart-topping cover of Holiday's I Love You Porgy on her 1958 debut, Little Girl Blue, and ostensibly culminates in her 1972 release, Nina, Sing Nina Simone Sings Billy Holiday, Lady Sings the Blues. The last album was a culmination of her holiday standards like Fine and Mellow and Love Me or Leave Me that she had already been covering throughout her career. In 1965, Simone told a reporter, quote, I know as people have often told me that I'm similar to Billie Holiday. I suppose that's because, because we have identical lives. In one or two ways, I've gone through things that she went through, both musically and personally, always pushed down and rejected. That's the way it was. That's the way it is. When you're stuck at such a point, you sing with a, a sort of resigned, disillusioned air about you." End quote. Simone's emphasis on being pushed down and rejected assumes a likeness to and linked fate with Holiday based on their identical lives as African-American women. Their mutual disenfranchisement as black citizens, however, is not simply a personal or political matter for Simone, but constitutive to, her, to their sonic interventions as well. Simone was the only artist to record Strange Fruit in the 1960s, long considered to be Holiday's signature, and Baba Mealy brilliantly writes about this as uh, the song, whether Holiday writes the song, well, she doesn't write the song, and she doesn't do the arrangement, um, and there's debates about, you know, at the time of authorship, she inhabits the song in such a way that it becomes Billy's song. Simone covered it on uh, her album, Pastel Blues, in 1965. She covers two songs and holiday songs in this album. She transforms Holiday's wonderful Tell Me More and More and Then Some from yearning to sexual demand from tort song to come hither. <laughs> By covering both a holiday love song and strange fruit on one album, Simone appears to engage with Michael Awkward aptly describes, and he's talking about Aretha Franklin's relationship with Dinah Washington here, or the cover of Dinah Washington, as quote, a combative reinvention, which is an opportunity for younger artists to present themselves as no longer true fans striving to honor their idols' performances, but as highly skilled craftspeople struggling to release the listener's imagination from the tenacious hold of their ancestors, end quote. So why is it that Dina dared to take on that holiday song, a ballad turned anthem, that melancholic witness of black death and white violence, a lament and laying on hands, a melodic embellishment that forced listener and singer, you and me, to be present as they, we want to flee, to see black bodies swinging from the trees. 
As the only other artist to record this song besides Holiday's fellow Cafe Society artist, uh, bluesman, Josh White, and uh, Holiday went after Josh White after he recorded it. Simone's capturing of this anthem was a way to connect that sonic and material past to her contemporary social mo moment, movement. A brilliant articulation of the durability of white racism and black pain, all versions of Strange Fruit are impressive enunciations of black protests and disavowal. But we can also see this as Simone's ultimate borrowing of Holiday's tort song. For what is Strange Fruit if not the tort song by the disenfranchised citizen for the state, for civil rights, for the idea and ideal of democracy? Cushioned between her recordings of Mississippi Goddamn in 1964 and Four Women in 1966, Strange Fruit is one of Simone's many polemics against the heartbreak of second class black citizenship, or second class citizenship. Though linked by the seeming obstinacy of racism, Simone's version is born of a different era, not the interracial bohemian subculture of the cafe society, but this squarely places her in the civil rights movement, the black national movement, and the feminist movement. There is no instrumental lead-in, no small band encasement, no pulling the listener into the scene of burning flesh, plucking crows, rotting bodies. Through a literal light of hand, Simone gives another version of Strange Fruit. Through reverence and revision, the audience is transformed from silent witnesses into active subjects. Like Holiday, Simone's version deviates from the song sheet, but she jumps right in, enacting authorship through her own orchestral-like orchestral piano accompaniment, her play with rhythmic accentuation, Someone puts herself and the audience in the center of the song and plays both with temporality and tempo. By recognizing Strange Fruit within her early repertoire and as the most obviously political song of pastel blues, we can consider Simone's covering of holidays of political rites of passage. Um, but because uh, Holiday is the one that she has to reckon with and repeat in order to be free. But it is also Simone's way of disaggregating uh, sort of black genius and black musical artistry from tragedy. And uh, you know, Farrah Griffin brilliantly reminds us that that Holiday's locked into a narrative um, of a of a tragic victim, and that she's too complex to be contained by that. But Simone, and I said earlier, she enjoyed uh, the comparisons. Um, by 1979, she started distancing herself, and someone compared her to her, and she says, "I'm certainly not in love with anybody, and he certainly hasn't left me out in the cold and all that junk." By the time she publishes her memoir in 1991, she's really mad that you compared her to Billie Holiday <laughs> and says, they only compared me to her because we were both black. They never compared me to Maria Callas and I'm more of a diva like her than anyone else. <laughs> <laughs> There's not a much blacker voice than Nina Simone, the sample. Inspired by the success of Talib Kweli's 2002 Get By, and that song s uh, samples Nina Simone's Sitter Man, which is also on Pastel Blues, uh, and that, that song's produced by Kanye West. But this song, producer and, Ka uh, producer and Kanye West protege Devo Springsteen, uh, this song that we heard earlier, Celebrate, features Simone's strange fruit. Keeping the lively backbeat of Get By, Springsteen aims to create a more melo melodic song, one that married hand claps with a mid-tempo beat and electric guitar solos, one which pairs uh, Simone's wail, black body swinging in the southern breeze, strange fruit, with John Legend's cry, you come to life, don't give up today, tonight we celebrate. And it's worth noting that John Legend's chorus is actually a cover of Terence Trent Darby's Dance Little Sister, which echoes the Rolling Stones or resists the Rolling Stones' earlier Dance Little Sister. Springsteen shot the track to several artists, Diddy, West, and Common, and eventually ended up with Cassidy. I'm, I'm gonna rush through. Ended up with Re Cassidy. Oh, okay, well, okay, it's okay. Well, I don't know if everybody feels that way. <laughs> uh, ended up with Cassidy, who's best known for his 2004 single, which featured R. Kelly, um, and the 2005 Swiss Beats produced song, I'm a Hustler. So Cassidy seems like an unusual inheritor of this song. <laughs> By the time Cassidy released uh, his 2007 album, Bars, uh, Brian Adrian Reese story, um, however, he had just served more than a year in jail and survived a near fatal car accident. As a result, most of the songs of this album grappled with the diatropes of faith and doubt, mourning and celebration, death and rebirth. Set against Cassidy's lyrics of redemption and self-reflection, Springsteen produces a song that transforms the original meaning of strange fruit. You could put it up a little. For Springsteen, the sound quality of Simone's voice made her an ideal choice for his track. When asked why he chose Nina Simone's Strange Fruit over Billie Holiday's seminal version, Springsteen had an unequivocal response. Quote, because of the rawness of her voice, her vernacular is more direct. Because of the intonation of her voice and style, there's something really black about her voice. And when you're trying to make black music, there's not a much blacker voice than Nina Simone. 
Aiming to achieve rhythmic and timbral uh, consistency, Springsteen juxtaposes Simone's blackness, that deep shading of her voice with Legend's soulful baritone, achieving a sonic gender ambiguity that matches, I dare say matches the genre or generic ambiguity of the song. Simone, describing Simone's voice as anti-singing, Guy Ramsey notes that Simone's uh, harsh timbre produces a counterintuitive effect. For Ramsey, quote, there's a deliberate disconnect between the beauty of what she's doing and the logic of it, end quote. Arguably is that sonic rupture, that tension between what is expected and what is heard that made Simone difficult for industry critics in the 1960s, but congruent to the heterogeneous sound, ideal, and soundscape of hip hop. Hip hop is dark art, Springsteen told me. The street, the struggle, the violence, and all those things that it means to be black in America. It is a dark concept. Her darkness makes her hip hop relevant, end quote. Alluding to a darkness that is both material and metaphorical, Springsteen underscores how sampling Nina Simone becomes another way for hip hop artists to connect themselves to broader social political movements, from lynched bodies to pumping dimes. But instead of gendering this lineage of black death and black dying as always and only male, Cassidy Celebrates shows how Simone's ver version builds upon the work of anti-lynching activist Ida B. Wells and anti-lynching vocalist Billie Holiday. Perhaps by sampling and citing Simone, Cassidy wraps himself into a matrilineal tradition of black radicalism, a tradition in which Nina Simone is both founding mother and daughter, one which launches a powerful critique not simply of American ra racism, but a feminist critique against Moyhan, against Cosby, and, against, and speaks out against sexist, conservative, uh, pathologizing depictions of single black mothers and their beloved black sons one that refuses scripts that attribute racial disparities in healthcare, imprisonment, mortality, education, and employment, unemployment, sorry, to bad mothering, to castrating and a, uh, amoral nurturing, and like strange fruit, cast the stubbornness of racism as institutional, intergenerational, and inherited. As such, Celebrate not only echoes Holiday and Simone, but is a shout out to black feminist vocal tradition of Kanye West, this is kind of controversial, Kanye West's label, mm -hmm. Getting Out Our Dreams good music, in which West not only credits his mother, Donda West, for his musical and intellectual development, but whose early hip hop production aesthetic heavily sampled Aretha Franklin, Shaka Khan, Shirley Bassey, but continues, and this is, she's a constant, continues to include Nina Simone's voice and piano riffs. So in the tradition of, and in contrast to Public Enemy's deliberate sampling of James Brown's al albums to access, access sorry, a, a masculinist black nationalism, the Good Family samples and covers, and I'm particularly thinking of John Legend's most recent album, Wake Up, and the last song on it is a cover of Nina Simone's I Wish I Knew How It Feels to Be Free, and it was really important for uh, Legend to have Nina Simone end the album, and he often sees himself in a tradition of Nina Simone. So this is another way we can think of a black feminist aesthetic within hip hop and celebrate Simone's voice provides a link to a past, while the layers of sound around, over, and behind it usher us into a new sonic space in which the lynched body is not vanquished, but partially submerged, partially amplified by the cathartic, the self-choreographed, celebratory of dancing black bodies. Cassidy closes this revival by ushering us into the future. Y'all could live it up, but don't give up the fight, y'all. We're elevating, so we're celebrating the night. Cassidy vis-a-vis -vis Nina Simone, vis-a-vis -vis Billie Holiday, John Legend vis-a-vis -vis Terrence Trent Darby, mixes genres and genealogies, further transforming the melancholic melodies of Strange Fruit into an almost unseemly, uncanny affirmation of hip-hop dance, of black ecstasy in lieu of black agony, black pleasure through a baptism in black pain. Thank you. <laughs> that's not the version I read, but that's okay. This is the original, not only the new. Anyway, um, it was a pleasure to read these four papers. Um, each is original, either introducing us to new figures or calling our attention to dimensions of others with whom we may be familiar. These papers take seriously our call to attend to the thought, the intellectual contours, contributions, and complexity of these figures as thinkers. As such, we see them through a different lens. Also, 
the papers, and you could hear this, the papers are creative, they are innovative in their own form and content, and they are beautifully and clearly written, something that I want to publicly commend all of the writers for. Mauricio Barros de Castro's da The Daughter of Samba, The Intellectual Trajectory of Lig Ligia Santos, introduces us to Ms. Santos, daughter of Danga, a pre pioneering samba composer, and, a, and she is a scholar of samba. As such, she is the first black researcher to publish a book about the music. Professor de Castro provides a rich history of samba, exploring its racial and class dimensions in order to contextualize the musical form. Ms. Santos' work focuses on what he calls samba's second phase, the period when it emerged as Brazil's, quote, national music. Herself a participant in samba culture, especially during 1963 through 65, when samba clubs became sites of cultural and political resistance, or I should say once again became sites of cultural and political resistance. Um, it is this conflict, it is this conflict or competing interests around the music and its meanings about which I would like to hear more. Does Santos in her work attend to these contradictory impulses um, a music born of resistance, born of struggle that becomes a national music and then has to be reclaimed for resistance and struggle. Um, and I'm just wondering if her scholarship elucidates upon that. Um, Samba's aunts and a daughter of Samba, immigrants from Bahia, the aunts who were, re who um, Professor Barros de Santos says were religious and economics reference for the community, supporters of the community and the culture. Um, where samba played in their backyard and had to be hidden from the police. Santos's grandmother was an aunt of samba. So I'd like to hear more about this lineage, not this biological lineage, but this intellectual political lineage. Clearly she departs in that she is not a singer or a dancer or a culinary artist, um, but she carves out a new path of intellectual work. Is there a relationship between the work of samba's aunts and this daughter of Samba, this person who documents the history, re, re, um, resurrects the personage who, personages of the form. I'm also curious, do other scholars of Samba cite Santos' work? Is she acknowledged as an important scholar of the music, as a pioneering scholar of the music? Professor Barros de Santos sees Santos Barros de Castro sees Santos as a scholar mediator, what he calls a bridge between two worlds. What I wonder is, are there costs of being a bridge? What possibilities does the bridge enable? Is that bridge two-way, um, the bridge between samba culture and academic culture? The bridge is an image and a metaphor that has emerged over these last few days. I think we first heard it in Alexis's work um, in her beautiful presentation yesterday. It appears in the second paper as well. In fact, it resonates throughout the second paper. Tiana Hardin and Grace Saunders, The Future is Feeling, Emotions, Tenderness, and Black Women's Intellectualizing is a meditation through the work of Entozake Shange and Marie Soleil, I, I'm not pronouncing her name, Agno, is that how she? Agno, um, on a meditation through their work on the complex, sometimes alienating conditions under which black women intellectuals or intellectual production takes place. They encourage us to attend to the way black women artists, activists, quote, have used feelings and emotions as an impetus for their creative and political work. For Hardin and Saunders, emotion and feelings are the bridge we must cross to understand black women's intellectual work. This deeply engaged and personal essay maps those alienating spaces of academia, classes, departments, journal pages, conferences, spaces that are all too familiar to all of us. It dares to name how we feel in those spaces and how responses to those feelings impact upon our intellectual life. Our training insists that we avoid feeling. Don't love black people, that's too messy. Don't feel black pain, that's too subjective. Don't embrace black beauty, makes you lose your critical sensibility. They encourage us to claim all of those things. The true originality and contribution here is the way that it theorizes that experience, not as a way that is separate and apart, looking at black women as objects whose messy emotions get in the way, but instead is central to an experience of many black women. Significantly, the texts considered here 
are not only literary, but theatrical, meant to be performed. So my question is, is there a reason that this genre, the genre, the theatrical genre, the play, that which is meant to be performed, is, that a, is there a reason that that genre in particular, of all literary forms, allows for an exploration of what you say, um, what you call women's estrangement from their desires, needs, and individuality, and the courage that it takes to reclaim their holiness, their sentience and their holiness, and that's how you all describe um, Shange's work, which is also a different way of reading Shange. It's not just this black male bashing play, right? Mm -hmm. But it's got this other richness and possibility. Um, our, oh, I'm gonna come back to that. Um, you end the paper saying that um, these two authors call us to recover um, a certain quality. This is exactly, I think, a quality of feeling. This is exactly what I think this paper does um, and that it is in fact, as much as it is a critical paper and a meditation, that it is also a manifesto for those of us who have gathered here this weekend, a manifesto that is clearing space for the work that we must do. So I publicly thank you all for, for the courage of giving us that paper. Gail Murchison's essay, Michelle Indigo Cellos, and I'm not gonna pronounce this right, even though, Pentateuch? Pentateuch, I should know, because my husband is a <laughs> biblical scholar, but. <laughs> I'll get it, I'll get, my, I'll get my tutorial later on. <laughs> Peace Beyond Passion, Preaching Hip Hop Gospels of Power, Gender, and Black Queer Resistance is a welcome and much needed discussion of the figure that I consider certainly one of the, if not the most brilliant of her generation, musician, songwriter, poet, vocalist, Michelle and Diego Cello. Um, we get a litany of, first, a litany of the possibilities and impossibilities of the options available to contemporary black women vocalists before attending to Andegio Cello's second CD, Peace Beyond Passion, her philosophy, ideas, and method, as well as her, quote, troubling of restrictive black female gender roles. I wonder if Andegio Cello's critique of the church in Peace Beyond Passion can be read as part of a much longer trajectory of um, black thinkers, black Americans, from David Walker to Frederick Douglass to Malcolm X, who talk about the hypocrisy of Christianity. Um, and they're mostly talking about giving us a critique of white Christians and their use and abuse of the Bible in the service of white supremacy. Um, and indeed, on that, if you, anyone knows that work on Peace Beyond Passion, before we get to Leviticus, um, before we get to the songs about homophobia and domestic violence, she seems, I mean, not even before, but also included in, it seems to me that she has inherited this critique. I mean, there are lyrics like, I'm so sure ashamed on bended knee, praying to my pretty white Jesus, Mother Mary full of grace, I'm so confused by your pretty white face. <laughs> um, and also, I mean, I think as a means of showing, I think, you know, and then she goes into this way of showing how black Christians have brought into a religion used to enslave them to then police and oppress black queer people. While earlier critiques focus on misreadings of the Bible, um, the disdain of gay people and the homophobia um, of the black church, she shows us results from a literal reading of the word. And then mm -hmm. she goes into those readings of um, Leviticus and Deuteronomy. And also, I mean, I just think even formally, she's tapping into something within that longer critique. And here's just one example. There's one lyric in Leviticus where she says, faggot better run, learn to run, cause daddy's home. Mm -hmm. And that just reminds me of run, nigga, run, Paterola's gonna get you. Right, mm -hmm. and there's this inversion going on that I, I just, I, I think she's doing something there. Mm -hmm. Professor Murchison also provides a rich, close reading of the video that accompanied the song, and I wish she could have, she had time to go through it in the longer version she does. Um, if I, I don't remember, but it might be worth pursuing, I think that there were actually two versions of the video. I think there were two different endings, so look, look into that, um, and I, I'd be curious to know if, you know, why there were two endings and if the director made that choice, if it was something else going on, but I think that there were two versions of it. Finally, I wonder if, um, and you talk about plantation lullabies a little bit more in the, earl in the longer version of the paper, but I'm wondering if the two actually ca could be seen as kind of text, I mean, could be read together. 
um, kind of an ex you know related projects, plantation lullabies and peace beyond fashion. Um, are they related to each other? So the first one, documenting a diverse mm -hmm. urban black community from black bohemians who read Entozake Shange on the subway to philosophical heroin addicts to black lovers who love blackness, let me run my fingers through your dreadlocks, I don't remember that, to black <laughs> men who <laughs> love white women, right? Although if I remember, there are no church folk there. I don't, re I don't know, maybe mm -hmm. there are, but maybe in music, we get in his first album a kind of a loving, tender portrait of black people, which then gives her the legitimacy upon which to launch the critique that emerges in Peace Beyond Passion, right? She's not an outsider calling out black people's homophobia. She's already proven that she knows and loves and is a part of this community. Mm -hmm. Professor Tillet makes, first of all, let me say, you know, she embarrassed me. <laughs> but, you know, that was, I mean, Sal Misha was one of the most brilliant students I've ever taught, and that that relationship was then and is still a mutual one. And the first sentence in the Billy, first chapter of the Billie Holiday book names her <laughs> and how much I learned from Sal Misha, you know, about, because I was only listening to Billie Holiday. She's like, well, Mary J. Blige, da, da, da. you know, so, <laughs> so <laughs> not in that way. She was always very generous. Um, <laughs> anyway. Um, I was so excited to read Salamisha's work on Nina Simone. I mean, I've been looking forward to this project, talking with her as she discovers and explores her. In this paper, she shares Simone's relationship to those who came before her and her mobilization by contemporary artists, particularly by Common and Cassidy. And I think she doesn't say this in the version you heard, but she makes a very important assertion, and I quote, that the sampling of Nina Simone should not be considered as a simple appropriation of the disembodied black female singing voice exclusively in the service of black male protest. Mm -hmm. And in the version, whatever you, know, whatever you do when you're revising, I think that should be foregrounded because I think that's the sort of natural way that people will want to read the moves that you describe and, and you prove that, that that's not the case. Um, the paper provides a rich and fascinating discussion of this iconic figure, her politicization and her aesthetic sensibilities um, the sign of Professor Tillette's success is that I just want more, more, more. Um, so my comments here are in the form of questions, not all to be addressed now, but perhaps in other incarnations of this work. Um, are there other musical ideas that, um, that, that Simone contributes um, or articulates uh, that are being used? You know, not simply, the, not only the sound of her voice, the way it sounds, but just, you know, are there, are there things that she does musically that we see inspiring some of these artists? Um, I want more, I want to hear more about how you define black sonic radicality. Um, you talk about her coming up with the genre and definition of black classical music. I wonder how that um, differs from or is similar to the use of that term, black classical music or classic black music by avant-garde jazz musicians. Um, later on, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm forgetting one group in particular, but the ACM and other people like that who talk about African-American classical music. I'm wondering if she's in dialogue with them or is she coming up with something whole cloth on her own? You know I have to talk about Billie Holiday. Um, how is Simone's relationship to Holiday, I wondered, um, similar or different to that of Abby Lincoln? They're contemporaries, they're friends. They both are initially identified with her, I think, for different reasons, and then they both distance themselves. Res well, I don't know, maybe Simone does it respectfully, but Abby, Abby does. You don't think she does? Okay, Abby does it respectfully. <laughs> so they both distance themselves, um, but so they're, they're identified as Billy's daughters and then find that too confining and remove themselves. But it seems to me that they're both identified with her for different reasons and separate from her for different reasons. And I guess I'm also just curious about Nina and Abby, um, that they're both sort of known for their, their politics, for their protests, for their image, um, representing a different kind of black beauty. And Simone has emerged as the symbol. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, I wonder if it's because of the genre of music she sang. Um, you know, did, did her, were her songs better able to have a broader audience? Um, how do we account for her ongoing visibility? Is it her own genius? Um, and I think that the distinction that she seems to be making between herself and Holiday, among the many, you know, you know, I, it's not about being 
what is it, loving being in love with someone or something, these love songs and holiday sings. But that it's also about her training and her musical literacy um, in that she compares herself to classical musicians and opera singers and the jazz genius instrumentalist men, right, that she's setting herself in that pantheon more so than in the pantheon of holiday. At the same time, um, well, I, I want you to also, let's go, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the, um, the people who use her, who are mobilizing her work. And um, I wonder if there is, you talk about like Kanye West and Cassidy and Common, but I wonder if you could play more, talk a little bit more about the difference between, if there is a difference, what West Kanye is doing with Nina Simone and what Cassidy is doing with Nina Simone. They seem like their use is toward different ends, but I, that might just be my lack of familiarity. And then finally, this is more of an observation than a question. Um, I just find it very ironic that at a time when these progressive artists are mobilizing Simone as sound and symbol, most Americans are um, hearing a Nina Simone song through Jennifer Hudson, um, who's singing about Weight Watchers, <laughs> um, <laughs> so that it's completely devoid of context hmm. and you know, place into this American obsession with consumerism and weight loss. And so I, w I just think it's ironic that it says something about the moment we're living in. Um, so I'll stop there. Thank you for wonderful papers. <laughs> I'm sure the, uh, all of you have uh, a range of questions that you're ready to raise to these wonderful papers. I, in light of this wonderful response, perhaps we would give each of the panelists a brief moment to respond to maybe one of the provocations, <laughs> questions, uh, nuggets that <laughs> Professor Griffin has offered, and then open it up. I believe we have a microphone runner, and so once uh, the panelists, if you would like to respond briefly, uh, they have finished. If you would just raise your hands, and the uh, microphone runner, Brittany, will find you. <laughs> All right. Uh, thanks for Professor Farah for the kind comments of my work. And uh, I think that Lydia show uh, a new way to the black woman in the samba community. Uh, and she has, the feel, uh, she has the feeling of the cultural and political legacy of the Aids of samba, uh, but uh, uh, she tried to show this legacy as a scholar. Mm -hmm. So I think that the importance of her work is to show this possible way uh, to the new generations of the doors of samba. Mm -hmm. And about the bridge, uh, certainly I think that be a bridge of two words, or two words or two cultures mm -hmm. can be a problem. Uh, the life story of Paulo da Portela is uh, an example of this. Mm -hmm. uh, he went to into obscurity trying to be uh, this bridge. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. I can say that Elijah uh, was successful being a, a, a transcultural mediator because now she's playing this role working with uh, public politics for the samba community. Mm -hmm. So I think it's possible. <laughs> you. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, first of all, for your thank comments. You. <laughs> really, uh, really appreciate it. And um, uh, th the question to reflect upon perhaps why and how the, the theatrical form of Shanghai's for Colored Girls lends itself to an exploration of how black women reclaim their sentience and holiness. Um, I think there are a lot of things to say about that, but I think one of the things that I would like to, to put forward is um, the fact that one, Shanghai considered herself a poet. She, and, and she would often say, you know, I'm not a dramatist, I'm really a poet who stages my, my poetry. And then in addition to that, she writes in her prefatory remarks to um, three pieces, which was published in 1981, that um, she wasn't interested in the politics of a piece, but what she was interested in was the poetry of the moment. Mm -hmm. And whenever you talk about the poetry of the moment, I think she's asking you to tune into what's happening right now, 
right? And I think that, that the theatrical form, because it allows that kind of emotional connection, that kind of emotional catharsis, um, that she was really, really um, invested in presenting her work in that way. And I think, too, that that's also rooted in the fact that a lot of um, black theater at the time was also turning to ritual um, performance, right? Um, performance that kind of um, invoked this r ritual sensibility in creating community and talking about healing. And I think that Shange was certainly a player in that, although she, in talking about black women, she also ha had a very distinctive stand about her, her part in that tradition. So, And that's how we're gonna stay on that question. <laughs> 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 no, in this process, we really learned to be patient with one another and trust one another. So when the question came, I was like, okay, I um, lend this to you. I trust you to take care of it. Um, so it's really been a learning process in community and in sharing in that way also. So we'll stay there. <laughs> oh. Well, thank you for your, your insightful comments. It's just nice to uh, have my work read by non-musicologists and people who really get <laughs> what I'm trying to get at. Uh, I, this paper had, had grown to mammoth proportions <laughs> beca uh, as I, and I had an extensive sex section on, on the first album, Plantation Lullabies, and, and especially dealing with, with the selections um, that, that you mentioned, the songs that you mentioned, because uh, it, it, for people who are familiar with um, Ndege Achello's work, not just with Peace Beyond Passion, but also with, with Plantation uh, Lullabies and her later, her later CDs, she can be, um, if you think that Lil' Kim or Missy Brown can just be downright erotic, uh, she can write some very, very engaging songs that express uh, um, love and desire, the, the full spectrum. You know, from um, and um, I so so th what I didn't get a chance to to talk about because I ran out of time was that that you know she's not out trying to she's not out trying to like dog anybody she's looking at this as she says as a cultural anthropologist and one of the most affected and effect effective tracks on peace beyond passion is not one where she's where she's talking about you know the law of moses or 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 you know or or revelations or or you know it's the last track where she is exploring and i think it's w it's one of the longest the last track where she's exploring um her place in her parents domestic uh, troubled marriage and how she, even as an adult, still wounded by this by the conflict, uh, is is trying to fix it, <laughs> which I think does relate to your comment about the importance of presenting, um, you know, love. How she is an insider. How she's not coming at this just to bash, just to criticize Black America. How she is an insider, and if in in peace. Plantation lullaby. She can sing about you know um, these 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 love relationships that are co these romantic relationships that are complicated by being in the inner city or by by having to 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 deal with substance abuse like in shooting up and getting high. Um, so I would like to have a broader f uh, forum where I can deal with all of those things in, you know, in, in working on this paper. Uh, it's already, the original version had grown to like 40 pages. <laughs> but uh, a whole book just on these two, two, on these two CDs. And then, of course, there's Bitter, which, which, oh, yeah. which I mean, it's just wrenching. So I really think that there, I really think that there's a trilogy in here. <laughs> We have a lot of questions, so I'll try to answer. <laughs> I'm going to answer them all in one thing. So, <laughs> um, well, I was uh, your your last point about Jennifer Hudson and feel feeling good. What's the name of the song? I feel feeling good. Feeling good. So I think I mean I heard on American Idol last year someone covered it, and I think you know there's both the um, Buble version, mm -hmm. so that's what they're covering on, on American Idol, um, and then you see Jennifer Hudson. Um, problematically using Nina Simone um, in, in this way, and I think it actually goes, it's, it sort of contradicts my earlier point, even with uh, John Legend in the Lexus ad, so there were those Diane Krall, 
Well, okay, it's a little different, but it's weird that he, so Langston Hughes and Nina Simone co-write the song Backlash Blues, and John's in the Lexus, and that's the song that he's listening to. So there's some irony between uh, um, that, and I think you can think of Jennifer Hudson, that, that kind of bizarre sort of use of Nina Simone, and I think um, depending on who's using Nina Simone, there's different things, right? So Pilot Perry, you know, and for colored girls, we have four women. Um, you know, Black Rock Coalition, Imani uses her differently. Um, Anthony and the Johnsons use her, right? And so I think her generic, um, her, her gender indeterminacy, um, I think Anthony, he accesses it as his own sort of transgendered identity. So she does so much for so many different artists. Um, and, and then also there's obviously like Alicia Keys and Jill Scott. Um, and then Mary J. Blige, mm -hmm. and, and I kind of rewrite the version of myself in your book by looking at the ways in which Mary J. Blige never wants to be compared to Billie Holiday, um, and yet is going to, is cast to play Nina Simone in, in the film. And I think it's about um, part of S Simone's relationship with, with, with Holiday, which may be different than Abby Lincoln's, mm -hmm. um, is I think that, you know, that the movie comes out with, uh, with Diana Ross, and Nina Simone is constantly then sort of critiquing that kind of image, mm -hmm. which she links then to Billie Holiday. But I also think there's um, in a, a sort of, you know, in the diary that's here at Columbia in 1965, she's haunted by, by Billie Holiday, and she says, I don't wanna be like Billie and Dinah Washington because they never got heard, right? And so she says that I, she's obsessed a little with her, her relevancy and her durability, and she then brings up the Beatles, and she's like, young people are listening to them. Um, for me to do this, I have to render everything anew. So it is this sort of self-making and self-invention that she's very conscious of, and I also think with the madness stuff, that she is suffering from a mental illness. And I think instead of sort of, you know, having a, a more complicated vision of, of Billie Holiday, she's trying to stave off potential misreadings of her that are always gonna associate madness um, uh, with black women's artistic genius. Um, and so, well, that's kind of like, that's fair, really, but okay. <laughs> but, um, also, I guess with the black classical music, I have to think about that more. I, I was thinking about like Baraka and Afro classical mm -hmm. music. And so, but I don't know why she ha uses that specifically, other than her own, I mean, it's probably a similar tradition, but also obviously always wanting to see herself as a classical mm -hmm. musician. And I think that gets to the point of the virtu virtuosity and the virtuoso, um, and why Kanye it uses her differently than Cassie. So Cassie just gets the song and really likes it, right? Um, and so that's why Devo Springsteen, I mean, I think he sees something important um, in it, and, and on that album, Angie Stone also sings the song. So there's a new Cassidy, but I think, and Devo says, you know, he wants to, be, he's trying to mirror or model it after Kanye West. But what I think is interesting about Kanye West, at least for me, and I'm not trying to say Kanye is like a black feminist, I'm not trying to say that, but what I am saying is on a, <laughs> but on a, I'm not saying that at all, but on a, on a son, and this goes to the level of virtuosity too. I think um, his own generic indeterminacy and his own attempt to establish himself as a virtuoso, not so different than Michelle Degliacello, because I actually think of her as kind of an heir apparent to Nina Simone. Um, and, and really in all of the, the ways that I think are useful. Um, but I do think, you know, Kanye uses her at, in such complicated ways because it's not just her voice, but he also uses her piano riffs. And then on the song that's dedicated um, on 808 Heartbreak, that album, the song Bad News, which is about mourning his mother, then you just get Simone's, um, you just get chords and, and from Sea Lion Woman, right? So that there's ways, in, I mean, this is really about, I mean, I would love this, this is gonna be about Kanye in some weird way, but I think, um, yeah, there's all this, a virtuosity, black genius, and the way in which he cast himself as that is through, subconsciously or consciously, through engaging Simone. So, but I think I try to answer a lot there. You answered that. Uh, okay. <laughs> well, yeah, sure, let's give our panel another hand. And we have about roughly five minutes for a few <laughs> questions, so ask that you please identify yourself and pose the question in the microphone holder. We'll find you quickly. <laughs> so, hello, my name is Mabula Sumovo. Thanks to all the panelists for uh, your papers. I have questions for all of you, but I'll focus on Professor Tillett and we can continue the conversation afterwards. Um, I had a question drawing on what uh, uh, Farah said um, about the rappers' uh, use of the samples by Nina Simone and how those rappers, uh, how do you position those rappers within the hip hop world? And I was wondering if you would be interested in expanding your understanding of the music produced by uh, Nina Simone in a global context, yeah. because you're yeah. talking about hip hop, and I was thinking about 
um, the musical career of Nina Simone in France, where she yeah. she, she she died yeah. eventually, yeah. and where she's also being sampled by French rappers. Oh. So I don't know if those rappers oh, are so cool. um, influenced by Kanye West or Cassidy or other people, mm -hmm. or if they are um, they produce their own understanding of Nina Simone directly. Yeah, that's so cool. that that might be something that uh, you would be interested in. Yeah, I don't have an answer though. No, that's two, really three. great. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, my name is Elena Singleton. I'm actually a PhD candidate at Rutgers University in the Department of Sociology. And I have a comment for Professor Murchison and a question that hopefully is not too far off topic for the ladies who co-presented. Uh, the discussant mentioned that there are two versions of the Leviticus Faggot video. Mm -hmm. And uh, as a teenager who was an avid music video watcher at the time and uh, also coming to grips with my own issues around sexuality at the time, I definitely remember paying close attention to that video. The two different versions mm -hmm. were aired on two different networks. One version was on MTV, the other on BET. Yep. I don't remember exactly. which was which, but mm -hmm. that I think is awfully telling depending on which is which. Um, how that message mm. was expected to be interpreted. Mm -hmm. If I'm not mistaken, one ending was rather bloody and depressing and the other kind of benign and um, not really drawing to a conclusion. And I think that could perhaps add a rich textual analysis to an already very rich uh, analysis. Um, for the ladies who co-presented, my question is not actually about the works you analyzed yourselves, but the fact that you are uh, inquiring about this dimension of emotionality or of, um, if I can extrapolate and say personal truths into this um, as, as a sort of reinterpretation or an undermining of this hegemonic idea of universal truth with a capital T. Um, and I wonder if you guys have any comments or perhaps suggestions or strategies for so many black women intellectuals who are extending their tentacles out into areas that are so frequently under-researched. Within the academy, the high degree of importance that's placed on having sources and citations that substantiate the claims that you're trying to make, when so often the stories of black women, the stories of people of color, the stories of queer communities, et cetera, are rooted in these rich emotional histories that don't have the academic background. How is it that we can incorporate that emotionality, that rawness into our own work? Something I struggle with myself. Mm. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I thought you were gonna comment. Sorry. I'm not that dense. Um, so I think it's an excellent question. Yeah. And I guess um, the one, one way that um, I can answer it personally uh, I, uh, I work on Haitian women's um, history, and uh, I was supposed to uh, be in Haiti for the year 2010, and I missed my airplane on January the 10th, and the earthquake happened on January the 12th, and all of the women that I planned to work with died. Um, and if you know anything about what happened in Haiti, all of the archives collapsed. And um, I immediately, I can be honest, went to a serious depression <laughs> um, that involved a lot of crying, so the archive of the tears, <laughs> that involved a lot of screaming out of nightmares of visualizing what happened to women that I um, cared and was inspired very much by. Um, and so I actually came to a conference at CAS at University of Michigan, and I was asked to present, and I couldn't find any words. I was just like, there's nothing to say. I really don't care about this thing called the Academy. I could care less about anything. <laughs> and I had to, I had to, and I, and Yana and I both was, she was helping me through my process, <laughs> um, really had to reassess what an archive is. And I think this is really important for black women's intellectual history because as you said, um, the traditional archives don't hold us um, in, in very real ways. They do not hold us. Um, and, uh, and I think we have to really be honest about where do we live? We live, in our, we live in our conversations. We live in our relationship to one another. And that is how we experience life. And that's how our lives should be recorded and documented as historical, literary, musical, et cetera documents, right? Um, and I think I would just encourage you, I, I'm, I, uh, I 
uh, my main medium right now is, uh, is oral histories. And um, I spend a lot of time talking with women and just sharing stories. Uh, and I think this is really important anyway to draw a level of validation to the, the many ways in which our lives are documented. They're not necessarily valued by um, traditional concepts of archives and things like this, but, um, but that for our stories, we have to create a new lexicon, a new language, as we've discussed, for how we experience our lives. That it, it doesn't really serve any purpose or perhaps is counterproductive to try to continue to fit ourselves into these models of what an archive is. Um, so, <laughs> so, and I think the other thing I would say is that this was hard work in the sense um, that you have to be really vulnerable to work with someone else. And so, but I encourage all of us to work together because this is the other thing that's very isolating about not having an archive is that you begin to feel crazy, yeah. you begin to feel invalidated, your work is not valued in the same way. And um, if we work together and really share our emotions, our ideas, our processes, I just find that it is much more valuable and we can produce quality work, which is what, you know, Audrey, our sister Audrey has asked us to do, right? To produce quality work and to really work hard at writing our stories the best we can and not in a, in a frame that's going to shut us down, um, leave us estranged from ourselves, uh, porcelain dolls, if you will. Um, and so, yeah, that would be my answer to I just want to say, you don't know, Saidi and I are just looking at each other, um, like really. Yeah. You know, oh, <laughs> it really is. And I wanted to call attention to this question of the archive and how, I mean, it just reminds me of the girl in Lose Your Mother and that, you know, just what Saidiya does in Lose Your Mother. And I was also remembering that the first article that we both published, we wrote together. So we know mm. that process Aww. too. So thank you so thank much you. for more than you know. I would provide yeah. one <laughs> other suggestion. Sorry, I just thought about this. Um, if you see here, this is like our little altar. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I think that having a space that is tangible for all of your experiences, whether it's journaling, whether it's um, artwork, which is, um, I actually help with art therapy for women who experienced the earthquake and who moved to Montreal, that's where I live now. And so just trying to really, words don't, can always capture it all, but really working through all of these mediums that everyone's discussed to really capture our lives. And that's the other suggestion I would, to just be vulnerable. Mm -hmm. yeah. Try. <laughs> Hi, I'm Imani Owens, Columbia University. I just want to say I'm really uplifted by this phenomenal um, panel. And just to, to echo what's already been said um, in reference to um, Tiana and Grace's presentation, um, I think it really, um, I was blown away by your presentation because I feel it models the kind of collaborative intellectual work that we're trying to recover, and also um, mm -hmm. the kind of collaborative work that's been done over the past two days. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So I really thank mm -hmm. you for that. Um, my question slash comment goes back to this idea of the how as um, a call for community that um, you say in your presentation, it's a beginning that masks, it masks itself as a tragic end. Um, and I thought that that was really rich, especially um, when viewed in the context of black experience in America, in the Americas, um, from the slave trade to the present, that I also hear in that, not only uh, that it masks the tragic end, but it's also a beginning and an end. Mm -hmm. um, when you consider that in order for the resurre resurrection to happen, that you talk about, that something has to die first. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So I want to kind of linger on that, and I think it also goes back to the idea of of the lost archive that you were talking yeah. about. Like what, um, in this call for community that the how uh, represents, what are the traces of, of loss or death um, or the memory of old forms of community that have been lost? So the acknowledgement of that in order for a new call um, for community to emerge, that the acknowledgement of, of what can't be recovered also has mm -hmm. to be talked about. So if you could just talk about that a little bit. And this will be our last response to oh. our final question, comment. Okay. Oh, me, okay. Um, <laughs> thank you so much, Imani, for, yeah, thank you for your comment and for, and for the question. And it, it ties for me back to what the, 
the young woman PhD candidate, I'm sorry, I didn't catch your name. Um, what you, thank you, what you were asking about the, uh, about the archive also. And um, the how, and, and specifically mm -hmm. that line, that it masks a tragic um, yes. end, was something that, that we went back and forth on because I think even as we've seen throughout this conference, there were a couple of moments where there were um, references to um, madness or you know this kind of psychosis. And it's interesting because you know we're at such a loss about how to take that in and how to assimilate that. Mm -hmm. But I think what the how represents in part for us is um, it kind of becomes a way to, to talk about what is intelligible within these traditional disciplinary lines or, or within the traditional ways that we think about archives. And the how becomes a way of building community through that kind of unintellig unintelligibility. And, um, and I think with that, what you're saying and, and what resonates in Heronage for us is that it becomes this place where the living and the living um, the dead come together. Because in this how, it, it's like it reverberates with this kind of, it almost reawakens these prior hows, right? And that comes back, I think, to the um, kind of conceptual notions of performance, but then also conceptual no notions of blackness. And, um, and we really just saw where the how could be this place where we could reach out and create community. And that um, it didn't have to be an end, but it could be a place where through this community, through coming to this place together, God knows what can happen, right? And so I'll just leave it at that. Thank you. Final round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. Come on, break. No break. No break. All right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Mia Bay is going to give us brief closing remarks. Before she does that, I just need to. Thank you, and thank some people who I want to name. There have been people who kind of been walking around with microphones and all of that, and people who made possible our being here. Sean Mendoza in the back, who if you travel. Sharon Harris is somewhere, probably sitting out there, putting out fires. All the graduate students, each panel had its own graduate student and um, who was there for you. And also, they were walking around with mics. They were copying things. They were working so hard. So bear with me, because I just want to give you their names. Navi, Tanya, Huayne, Ashley, Melissa, Erica, Jarvis, even two who graduated years ago and came back <laughs> because they wanted to work and help us out. And that's um, Zinga Frazier, who was here, and Tamika, who I don't know if she's still here. But I want to thank them, too. Um, my co-directors, Barbara ha um, Savage, Mia Bay, Martha Jones, all the members of the working group who work so tirelessly. Can you just stand up if you're in the working group, please? collaboration because they didn't say I want to present my own research you know <laughs> but we're really you know really wanted to hear and, and, and engage the work of others Mariam Aziz who is the undergraduate who worked with us today so thank you not today the whole conference she's been here at the break of dawn every morning so thank you Mariam <laughs> all of our moderators Yosef Abosede George E Francis White um, the staff and faculty of of staff of Faculty House who fed us, quenched our thirst, set up the rooms, cleaned up behind us, the AV people who made sure we had PowerPoint and that the mics worked and that we were live streamed. And I was getting texts about that, so that was working. Um, and of course, the Center for the Critical Analysis of Social Difference, the Institute for Research in African American Studies, the Institute for Research on Women and Gender, um, the Institute for, I don't know what this acronym is, I forget, it's ISERP. Institute for Economic and Social and Economic, Social and Economic, Social and Economic Research. Policy. Right. Policy. <laughs> I'm tired. The Office of the Provost um, and the History Department. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Mia Bay will um, give us closing remarks, and then we've got a special treat to send us off. Brevity rather than brilliance. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and it's 
That's a good excuse. <laughs> also, a good excuse is that this has been just a, such a richly stimulating conference filled with brilliant presentations, mm -hmm. generative discussions, and extraordinary exchanges of ideas. So it's, it's a good note to end it all. We began, when we began this project, we really began with a subject that was the question towards an intellectual history of black women, sought to figure out whether such a history existed or could be recovered and whether it would provide an interesting analytical framework for the study of black women. I think this conference has settled the issue. <laughs> Organizing it, even before you all gathered, it was clear to us um, that there was extraordinary work out there. As we uh, as we we began with a call for papers, and we got an abundance of riches as we were reading your responses. Mm -hmm. uh, the forty odd papers that were presented here were chosen from almost two hundred submissions, most of which were excellent. Had we time and money enough, we could have held a conference double or triple the size of this one, mm -hmm. um, or we could have met many more times. <laughs> <laughs> right now, I'm sort of glad we're not. <laughs> <laughs> but instead, practical concerns forced us to be ruthless in selecting the papers we accepted and organize a conference which shaped the most brilliant of the many wonderful proposals we received into a finite number of thematic panels designed to reflect the depth and breadth of the work being done in this field. And what a dazzling reflection of that work you have all provided. It is our turn to thank you for your contributions. We have really never heard so many outstanding papers at one gathering. This conference has showcased a wide range of truly amazing work examining the intellectual activities of black women across the Americas and in Africa from the 19th century to the present day. Um, I won't review all the many subjects we've touched on because of the lateness of the hours, but just, um, just say that, I mean, we, um, that the panels taken together has sort of underscored the range and diversity of black women's intellectual labors. It's, they're not limited to educated women. They also include the creation of black artists and musicians, as well as uh, the challenges faced by women who still remain anonymous, women uh, dealing with slavery, women confronting HIV, um, black women in all sort of professions and levels of education have had to um, struggle with the issue of self-definition as a starting point for managing in life in a certain way. Um, black women have long been on the outskirts of conventional definitions of womanhood by virtue of their race and rarely considered natural candidates for race leadership by virtue of their gender. And as a result, they've often been overlooked by both black and white leaders and had to define themselves and represent their own interests. If biography looms large in the intellectual history of women, as Martha Jones, black women, as Martha Jones has suggested, it's perhaps because of these issues of self-definition. Um, women have often had to define and describe the specific circumstances that even animate their intellectual intervention. And in saying that, I'm thinking of Anna Julia Cooper and her famous intervention in A Voice from the South that talked about um, that until race, color, and sex and condition are seen as accidents, black women would have a distinctive worldview that no one else could speak for. Mm -hmm. Yet at the same time, I think as we've seen, the rich tradition of self-education, creative thought, political analysis and collectivist organizational strategies that black women have mobilized to reflect on rep and represent the interests of them, their interests as individuals and communities are still rarely appreciated as intellectual work. Uh, notably, even black women's activism, which is almost always informed by a critical rethinking of the social conditions that black women, act black women activists challenge, is often discussed as a natural phenomenon. Whereas the black male intellectuals around whom the history of black thought is largely written are written about as 
thinkers who have crises and debate intellectual positions, black women's activism is often portrayed as a matter of anger or common sense um, that requires little further explanation. The papers we have heard over the last few days put such assumptions to rest by exploring the myriad of ways in which black women have sought to secure an education, find a public voice, and mobilize ideas to challenge the race and gender discrimination they face. Um, at the same time, however, the rich work that we have heard today also underscores how much work we still have to do. As many of you have emphasized, the history of black women's intellectual work is poorly documented and not always archived. It is often taken place under the radar of public notice or acclaim. Some of it has taken the form of the kinds of creative and generative service work that's not usually considered intellectual, such as the work done by archivists or organizational work by done, done by race women, or the educational work of many women in black colleges and, and outside them as well. Such work has actually shaped the African American tradition writ large, as I think Alexander, Elizabeth Alexander's wonderful talk yesterday emphasized. Um, it has also widened the educational path for many of us in this room. But it can be invisible even to us and our ch challenges to recover it. Um, yeah, yeah, both the, I would say at this point, both the creation and preservation of black women's intellectual history is clearly in our hands. C current studies of black thought are still largely devoted to the study of black men. And outside our group, few scholars seem likely to cha challenge the male-dominated character of such scholarship. Our project has taken shape around the idea of recovering the intellectual history of black women, precisely to underscore that all scholars need to begin to ask about what black women thought. And in this endeavor, we want to enlist your help, for this is a job that will require a broad-based collective effort on all of our parts. Our project at this point has ongoing ambitions to push this point with an edited work on black women's intellectual history, as well as an expanded website that features syllabi and materials for editors. Mm -hmm. We'll be posting links to all this new material on our current website. But our meeting has suggested that still more needs to be done, and more people need to do it. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> we need more conferences, more volumes, more publications, more opportunities to exchange our work, and more opportunities to be informed by the work of others. Clearly, many of you agree. We have been getting questions about when we will, whether we'll meet again, whether we'll publish papers, how this project will be sustained. Well, I'm here to tell you I'm not entirely sure. <laughs> um, <laughs> Martha Jones, Barbara Savage, Farrah Jasmine Griffin, and I still have to finish out the first phase of this project by completing the working group's edited volume on black women's intellectual history and creating a more content-rich website. And we've also begun to discuss creating some kind of organization for the study of black women's intellectual history. But to be honest, we're still just talking about that. In the short term, we plan to follow up on, the, uh, up on this particular conference by archiving it on the website um, and expanding our web presence as well as publishing the volume. Uh, we are also happy to entertain your comments and suggestions as to future initiatives. We're happy to post your papers if you wish. And in terms of moving on beyond that with additional publications and organizational work, um, We'll see what we do, but we're also looking to widen the circle at this point. This topic is not our exclusive preserve. Far from it. We hope that this conference will foster new conferences and collaborations with other institutions, and we will lend our support to such initiatives. Moreover, we encourage you to submit your papers to a wide variety of journals, and think about how some of your wonderful panels might support special editions and journals or edited works. And finally, and more specifically, we encourage you all, res all to respond to Stephanie Evans' call to submit papers for the Association of, the, for the Study of African American Life, History and Life's 
2012 conference, for those of you that missed it at the lunch round table, Stephanie Evans talked to, she's the program chair and their theme next year will be black women in American mm -hmm. culture and history. So the plan is we can all meet again there. <laughs> Just put in your paper proposals. <laughs> Thank you very much. Now we're gonna we're, now we're gonna close out with a performance. Can you